Welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Ah, but not tonight. Not tonight. No, 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 no. See, we're going to do like our silly behind attorney general, and we're going to go down to the border. Right, we're gonna go down to the border today, but we're not gonna go to the Texas border. No, we're gonna go down, down to the river, down to the Ohio River, and we're gonna cross over and we're gonna talk to some people from Louisville. Because that's how we do it. Louisville, Louisville, Louisville. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know we're going to Kentucky, where they actually have a Democratic governor. <laughs> they actually have one. Indiana, I need y'all to wake up, but I cannot possibly not at all, have this conversation tonight without my little bro, my big bro, one of the smartest dudes in the business who's the media thing <laughs> out, of, out of Clark County. Y'all know one of my favorite counties, Jeffersonville, Indiana. Y'all give it up for my dude, Gully, from Common Conversation, Miguel Hampton. Miguel, welcome to the show. Are you, you sound effects ain't working today. What's good, wait, man? Wait, we need to get some, some clapping going on. We, we need some sound effects. I mean, between the two of us, we should be able to work that out. I know, right? And they should be readily available. We, there's a button somewhere in here that you can punch and it rocks, but you know, it is what it is. Right? <laughs> and we're going to figure all of this out. So, so it's so nice to see you and to hear your voice because it's been a minute. I know, man. I miss you so much. And I think Nick and I are planning a trip down. There's a Harris County Democratic dinner. I bought the tickets already. And we're like, yo, it's time to stay at our regular Airbnb that we visit in Jeffersonville. So I'm coming down soon. And I get to let's see go, you let's get and it. the wife. That makes me happy. I know, right? You can see this grown girl that's running around here. I see she got a driver's now. license. Man, scary. Well, that's a that's a that's another a story non, for another day. That's another podcast conversation. So, and man, but you know what? Your business down there is growing by leaps and bounds. And when I say there's enough for everybody to eat, you know, you have your common conversation, but you have your whole media company. Tell the people about your media company so they know when they need that work done who to holler at in Southern Indiana. Most dev. So we do. So yes. So common conversations has been around for a long time now. And it's, you know, I pick it up. It's in anywhere from politics to social justice to business conversations. Um, and so we stream on YouTube, Facebook, and a variety of other spaces. And then we also do live events within our community. So that's between Louisville, New Albany, and Jeffersonville, where we do a series of events called Women's Empowerment. Um, I also produce a series of podcasts for KCADV, which is Kentucky Domestics for Ah, I can get that out of my mouth, right? So there I go. Uh, we're just gonna leave it at KCADV, and I'll get back to that later. But um, on the on the media side, man, it's been good. You know, since the shutdown, we 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 got back into a lot of video production and doing a lot of live streaming, right? Because when people were shut in, it was like, yo, we still want to have, um, we still want to tell our stories, we still want to have our events, we still want to have our trade shows, and businesses were definitely trying to grow. And so the fastest way to do that was in and with video um, and so from video production and photography we are definitely jumping off the ground and helping a lot of small businesses sustain and grow um, helping a lot of candidates get their message out there as well uh, and so it's it's just a time right and so i tell everybody 2020 was a good opportunity for most of us to slow down um, hit a reset button and kind of redefine where we want to go and how we want to get there. And so even the business courses programs that I teach, you know, we thought they were going to stop. They did um, for a short period. And then we were like, hey, let's launch these things virtual. Um, and so those are those have picked up as well. Except for this year, I'm so excited. Uh, we're going back to in person. Hopefully there's no no continued spread, no continued spread of the next whatever. Um, and, and we can do that. Right. Because we all need you know, we, we all need to get back together. Absolutely. Right. We, we, we need personal touch and engagement. It's a real thing. I love it. And, you know, I'm so proud of you. And I steal a lot of your ideas because I'm not as smart as you are when it comes to this stuff. I'm a novice. And this is your passion. Stop this it. is your love. And I appreciate you always dropping them nuggets of knowledge on me. And we sit around and we chop it up on how we can be better. Trust me, that's going to be some collab work coming. Y'all just wait. Just sit back and wait. There's going to be some Come collab on, I'll, work. I'll, I'll pack some gear. We'll bring it up there to the state house and, um, and, and, and bring all the representatives out and Absolutely. do like a big live stream. Let's get it. I love it. So let me ask you this. When you brought to me that you have a judge from Kentucky that you wanted me to talk to, I need you to explain to me 
why you wanted me to holler at this young man? Well, you know, I have a good friend of mine named Bernie, um, and we do a lot of work together. And Bernie said, hey, I know this guy who's running for office. He needs some help, and he's a really good guy. Would you take a look? And I said, yeah, sure. And I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to get into politics right now. You know, but let's let's take a look. And, and I went to his website, and it's timbuckleyforjudge.com. And, and I started reading a lot of the stuff that he had out there. And it, and it just seemed like a really genuine guy, right? Really intelligent, um, was doing a lot of explanation and sharing of what court is. And, you know, you know, through our conversations and, and our running and uh, running other candidates and other campaigns, you know, a lot of times the voter is not as educated as we ought to be. Right. And very few candidates are as educated as they ought to be. Um, and then when I, and so finally I got a chance for Tim and I to meet and I met him, his wife and, and his crew, Nancy, what's up if she's getting to watch this. Um, and I realized like he's a, he's genuine, right? And here's an attorney who's genuine, who wants to run, um, who decided to step up in the lead and who better than this, let's say, let's have a conversation with Dana, right? Uh, Cause Dana, you, you touch all the greats and let's be honest about that. And so I'm right now taking Tim on and, and I said, let me find every opportunity that I can uh, to bring him to the forefront so that people can get to know him. I mean, just brilliant. It's um, And Tim, you correct me. I know he's going to be on here uh, if I say anything wrong, but you know, he's written over 1600 legal opinions. Um, you know, he's been in the court for 33 years. You know, he's worked with some of the top judges um, in our community. And so I think it's, it's just being able to sit down with him and understand that why he's the perfect judge right the perfect leader um for this role um in terms of circuit court in jefferson county i love it well introduce him tim buckley welcome to the show <laughs> thank you very much dana for having me on i love it you know i always ask my candidates here in indiana uh, because one of the one of the things i've always tried to do is to humanize right, the candidates, because some of our regular listeners and, and voters out there, they want to put candidates and elected officials on these crazy pedestals. But I like to remind them, A, they're regular everyday people. Hence, I need you to put your name on the ballot. That's kind of how I do that. <laughs> <laughs> but tell the people who you are and where you come from. And you can start from when you, you know, was a young lad hanging out in the in the streets of Kentucky or wherever you were from. Young lad. Know. Well, I, I was actually born in Cincinnati, but I spent most of my time growing up in a town called Maysville, Kentucky. I was born in Cincinnati That's too. Mostly... I was born in You're Cincinnati You're from Cincinnati too. too. So my, fa my family has deep roots in Maysville, but when I was looking to go away to school, I got a scholarship to go out to Quincy, Illinois, a small school called now called Quincy University. And it gave me an opportunity to expand beyond my small town borders. But what I knew I wanted to go to law school and I knew that I wanted to practice law in Kentucky. So I came back to attend the University of Louisville Law School. I also worked my way through my second and third year, starting in the circuit courts even back then. And, I, and after I graduated, I got a full-time position in the circuit court as a staff attorney. That's a position working directly for several judges at the time where you assist with, with writing orders and opinions, doing legal research, and often sitting in and giving recommendations to the judges. That gave me an opportunity to really see what court practice is like and learn all the ins and outs of both the law and procedure. I also had the opportunity, I was sworn in as a district court trial commissioner. What they allowed us to do at the time was to serve on overnight duties when bail calls came in or emergency protective orders or emergency custody orders or mental inquest warrants. But at, I worked there for a total of seven years after which my friend Judge Bill Knopf got elected to the Kentucky Court of Appeals. And he asked me to come with him to work for him there. And I had been, I had been with the Kentucky Court of Appeals for a total of 20, more than 26 years now. And my duties there in some ways are similar, in some ways are different. I work on a case from the beginning to the end. When it comes in, 
I review, I would review the record, I would review the arguments of the parties, I'd research the law, I'd give my recommendation to the judge, I then listen to the judge and see which way my judge wanted to the case to go. And then I would write the opinion. And we had the Court of Appeals in Kentucky hears all appeals from the lower from circuit court, except criminal cases where the person is sentenced to more than 20 years imprisonment. So we don't get any death penalty. We did not get any de death penalty cases, but we got cases nearly every other type of case. We got we got appeals from administrative agencies. We heard pretty much everything. And that gave me an opportunity to really learn the law in detail, to go in, to go into depth and to see what court practice is from around the state. So but let's back it's, up a little it bit. It has been a wonderful job. I've loved doing it, but I've been convinced for a long time that there's probably more I could be doing with my skills. And I have been doing more. I volunteer extensively in with my church with my church. We've been going through and they keep electing me to leadership positions because I keep saying yes. Uh, I'm also involved in a social justice group called CLOUT, Citizens of Louisville Organizing United Together. We're a coalition of 19 religious congregations from throughout Louisville that work together on issues of social justice. I've been their treasurer uh, for several years. I served 15 years as chair of their finance committee I've also applied my legal knowledge by serving on their, their Affordable Housing Research Committee, their Restorative Practices Research Committee, and most recently on their Crime and Violence Research Committee. These are issues I'm passionate about because I'm interested not just in the law, but in how, they how the law affects people and how to improve the law. So I want to back up a little bit because, you know, before sure. you could become a clerk and do all the internship, um, there was something inside you as a young lad that said, I, I want to get into law. Tell us that story that said, because going to law school, going, you know, everybody's life experiences are different, but what was it that made you say, I want to study the law? What events happened? What, you know, happened in your young life? In high school, I took a class on American government and I enjoyed the class. I've always been interested in politics, but we got to the session on law and the courts. And our class had a mock trial and I volunteered to be the defense counsel. And I really got into that. I, I thought I, being a 14 year old, I didn't know what a lawyer did, but I watched enough TV to really play it up, ham it up. And, and be the hard hitting defense counsel. But I really liked the idea of being, of being a part of a, the system. And it also influenced me very heavily that about that same time, there was a murder in my town of Maysville, Kentucky. A, there was a grocery store robbery and a police officer was killed. And during the, during the trial of the person who was when the person was on trial, my father was called as a member of the jury. And this was big news throughout the town. They actually let us off school to watch the trial. And I had the opportunity to see what lawyers do on both sides. And it just it just clicked with me. This is what I want to be involved in. This this is something that's important that makes a difference to people that people need to see that justice is being done and it's something i i the more i learned about the law that simply the more i wanted to do it i i had decided at the age 14 or 15 that i really wanted to be a lawyer because it just appeared it appealed to to everything to everything, all my values, being of influence to the committee, making the community a better place, helping people. Those are all things that just really have always appealed to me. I love it. Gully, you look like you're ready to jump in there. 
Nah, I just love the fact that he's sharing his story, man. And, and it's it's just, uh, I think what allows people, what makes him so relatable. Again, you know, it's, it's um, he, he tells an authentic story, you know. So, I mean, I've, I've seen enough races where, you know, you got candidates that only tell you that part that they think everybody should hear, right? And they're not, you know, they're not believable, right? It's it's super scripted, you know. Um, Tim is is to some degree scripted, but it's not super scripted, and he's willing to share who he is, man. And that's that's well, awesome. You know, what some we we do need our candidates to be at, at times scripted, but that's why I like hearing the personal stories. That's why I ask those personal stories because. You know, again, if you if we just go into um, all of my years of service and all the things that I've done, they don't necessarily understand that there's a path to get to the place where you can start the journey, right? I mean, there's so much that is involved there. And we have a lot of young people that listen to the show. And so I love letting them hear, right? You may, you may have started off in one place, but you may end up somewhere else. You started off like, yo, I saw this trial. A, how many young people get that experience? That in of itself is amazing. So now I'm gonna need all the attorneys that I know. I know lots of y'all. I'm gonna need you to grab a kid, take him to court with you. <laughs> Cause you never know who's gonna be inspired, right? True story. I love True it. True story. So now you, you've been a judge, you're doing your thing. I have not oh, been I'm a sorry. judge. I'm, I'm running You've been an attorney. Judge. See, I ain't gonna lie. I've been watching uh, Justice uh, Jackson's hearings, and I'm as as a black woman in America. I'm like on tilt. So please forgive me. You're not there yet, but you're on your way. Now, criminal justice. That's my plan. So, so explain to those who of us who may not necessarily understand what does it mean to work as an attorney in the circuit court. Well, Kentucky has two levels of trial courts, district court and circuit court. Now, I'm not quite as familiar with the Indiana system, but dis in Kentucky, district court handles all the lower level cases, the traffic cases, the misdemeanor cases. Those are cases where you could be sentenced up to a year in, in jail. They it's all the civil ca cases where the amount in dispute is under $5,000. That includes a lot of small claims. It includes eviction court. It includes, it includes uh, other cl claims, mo mostly uh, claims that just between, often between neighbors who are having arguments. Circuit court is the, is the general trial court. It handles the criminal cases involving felonies, the civil cases of more than $5,000, and the civil cases of where involving title to real property. So that's going to bring in the foreclosure actions and things like that. You also see, can get appeals from district, from district court and from, from certain administrative agencies that are located within the county. Jefferson County for Kentucky, for example, has the Kentucky Board of Medical Licensure and the Nursing Board and several of those medical medical panels. So Jefferson County Circuit Courts see a lot of those type of cases where there are disciplinary cases brought against medical professionals. Being in the circuit court, it, there are a lot of different roles, but when you're working at, for example, as a staff attorney in the circuit court, you're working directly with, with a judge. And at the time I was working with several judges and they have a responsibility. They have a very extensive docket. They have, they have to manage hundreds of cases and thousands of motions that could come in in every week. And they they have they have to get orders out. They've got to make rulings on objections. They've they've got to schedule cases for trial, and usually they have to schedule several cases at a time because some some trials don't go for go to trial ever or the first time when they're scheduled. So they have to have backups to fill fill that schedule so they don't get behind. And what they often do, they have staff to help them out. So to help prepare these orders or to research the law on certain issues. 
or to go find things in the record. I got very skilled at that in circuit court, going through and cataloging the record so that I could go in and pick something out for, that the judge needed when he needed it or she needed it for in that case. So it, my experience covers pretty much everything that comes before a judge. And unlike a lot of people, I'm not coming this from one particular side. I'm not a, I don't have a prosecutor background or a criminal defense background or a civil plaintiff or a civil defendant background. My background has, has essentially been to look at, at what comes in objectively and give my best recommendation and in many cases, make my judge look as good as possible. And so, and, and, and in doing that work um, and getting your circuit court, that experience has led you to say, okay, now it's time for me to step up and run for the judge seat. That's a, that's kind of a leap, right? It's, I mean, not every lawyer yes. <laughs> should be a judge and not every, you know, not every judge has been a trial attorney either. We, we've seen, right? I mean, Amy Colby, no. Barrett. But in all the time I've worked in both the circuit court and the court of appeals, I've worked for ju uh, judges I've had a great deal of respect in for. I would not have stayed as long if I didn't enjoy it and love what I was doing. And I've tried to be involved in the community, but I've reached the conclusion that life is too short just to play it safe. I have a lot of skills. I'm good. I'm extremely good at what I do, but at a certain point, you have to stand up from behind someone else's shadow and say, tell the world, I'm Tim Buckley. This is what I'm, I can do. And I'd be a really good judge at doing it. Was there one incident or was there, was there a series of incidents or was it just a natural uh, maturation of your career that made you want to run for judge? I think that sometimes, sometimes it can be just a spark, right? I wouldn't say there's one incident. I've, I've spent a lot of time, time in my life practicing. It's one of the reasons why I try to be so active in the com in community organizations, in my churches, in, in social organizations, in clout, which I've just talked about, because I really do have desire to make my community a better place to live. And, but it can be very comfortable doing the same thing over and over. But what COVID has taught me is that nothing is safe and secure. And sometimes you, ha you have to pull yourself out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. the, and, I, and another thing that really influenced me, my, my wife, Jane, was diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. several years ago. And she went through treatment she went through surgery. It was a very difficult time, but she's, she's in remission and she's doing well. Jane has been my biggest cheerleader and my biggest fan. And when I forget, she reminds me of, of how much I can accomplish and how much she believes in me. And she reminds me to believe in myself. And I've realized life is too short and too uncertain to put off the dreams and hopes and aspirations just to play it safe. You really have to take these chances. Uh, man, that, that's powerful. That is so, Gully, that is so powerful. I, you know, it is. And, and, you know, Tim is, Tim is, um, you know, he's got a lot of humility. And so I want to say this, too, because in, on this journey for running for circuit court judge, he's got some of my, some of the most prestigious people um, in the community behind him wow. um, and who are supporting him. Retired judges, um, Tom Wine, who's Commonwealth attorney. Um, and so he's got a lot of leadership there. I know a lot of times in, in, in campaigns, folks go after the political action committees and they go after the the social and, and, and political organizations for endorsements. 
Um, but it means something when the community um, and your peers and those who you have, have worked for say, hey, this is your time. This is a thing you should do. Um, I mean, Tim, if you you'll share, you know, you know, some of the most current re endorsements that you've received. Well, as you mentioned, Tom Wine, who I work I worked for for a total of six years, my old friend, Judge Bill Knopf, who's now who's now retired, but he has endorsed me and former uh, Kentucky Supreme Court Justice Joseph Lambert. I had simply asked him for his experience of working with me, and he sent a very strong, powerful endorsement. And sometimes, as you said, I tend to be somewhat humble, but it's helpful to be reminded that, yes, I have made a difference in these people's lives and that they would recommend they would endorse me to the public. Yeah, and that, and that's real. So like when you when you you think about, you know, trial attorneys or, or specialists or whoever is going after a particular seat, you know, it's it's something that's new to them. Um, and, and again, most candidates, right, they've never had the job, they've never been in a place where they understand it. And I think, again, the unique piece about Tim is that he's actually worked for the courts. He understands how they how they run. He's done, he's been on the research end of making sure that um, information comes out and, and it's 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 not biased, um, it's fair, um, and that people, you know, are part of this equi equitable thing that we talk about is, is often not equitable, right? Um, and so he he's pushing that envelope. And that's, again, you know, why he, he decided to run and why he's a great candidate and should uh, hopefully be elected here um, in Kentucky or Louisville uh, specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, when, when you've got when you've got great people behind you, you know, pushing you forward, that's, that's an awesome reason to do okay, it. Okay, so, well, then let's get congrats. into let's get into the nitty gritty of why, you know, and what all these great things you got going on. You know, Gully, you just got to talking about, you know, equity and what we think is equitable. Um, Tim, you talked about you know, your social justice work and, and you know, I, I, people always assume when we use the term social justice, it is only meant in the terms of people of color. So you, 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 you talk about collaborative work and many of us, uh, especially people of color, we don't always see that the justice system is just, is just for us. You know what I'm saying? It's not just us, it's just them, right? I need I, for people who are going to be voting for you because you're going to be on the bench and you some of their family members is going to come before you. How do you see and what does it mean to you to, once you become judge when you win, right? Because you're going to win this election. Yes. What does it mean to you to be fair and equitable uh, from the bench? And how will you use your social justice work? And the experiences, right? You can't obviously bring it into the rulings because there's rulings, blah, 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 but it shapes the human, right? How does how is that going to work out for you when, when you're on the bench? One of the most important things I've learned from my social justice work is the importance of listening. In our process, which we do, we begin by simply listening to each other's stories. What, what keeps you up at night? What, what in the community concerns you or what's affecting you and your family? And one of the things I've learned during the many listening processes is that most people have the same concerns. Is there, they don't, people don't want gun violence on their streets. People don't want their kids suspended or sent to jail for minor school, for minor school misbehavior or people, people don't want, uh, people need affordable housing. They don't wanna spend 50 or 60% of their income on, on just having a safe place to live or even an unsafe right. place to live. These are all things that, that in many ways work with what I've found in the courts when you when parties come in at each side is is arguing their own their own side of the truth their own point of view they're trying to convince the judge that or the jury that their point of view is the correct point of view the truth often lies in not only lies in between 
It often lies between the lines, but you have to listen to what they're saying. And again, that gets back to the importance, importance of listening, of understanding what's important and why it's important. I've also seen very much the fact that most people who have to come to court don't know what's going on. You, if you have to come to court, it's usually not a good thing, right. except in a very, very few rare circumstances. And then you get there and it's crowded and it's noisy and people are talking and you don't understand what's going on. And then you follow on the news and you see a lot of things you don't understand. You see people who seem to, who it seems like they should be convicted walk away, and you see people who maybe shouldn't be convicted or only a, who who've gotten into minor scrapes with the law sent away for long periods of time. And a lot of people just say, "Why? How does how?" is this even supposed to work? And part of that is that in the courts, we haven't done a good job just explaining it to mm -hmm. people. And the other part is, is that as, court, as a public service, we have to respect that all the people who come before us have a right to be treated equally right? and fairly and with respect. That even if the outcome isn't what you want, many people are satisfied, at least somewhat satisfied, if, they're, if they feel like they've been treated with respect and fairness and not having their time wasted. I've seen too many situations where people come in, for example, to pay a fine, and they have to spend half a day off of work to sit in court to wait to be called. That, that doesn't make any sense. Right. So there are many, treating people with respect and listening to their concerns. And that includes criminal defendants, witnesses, police officers who have to come in. But it also means making sure, making sure, sure that the law is applied equally to everyone. That no one side has an unfair event, no one side or party is given a is given favoritism or bias but to make sure that the law is applied equally and that's what i'm committed to you know one of the controversies that comes with the criminal justice system tends to be um, how law enforcement handles suspects or the public for that for that matter mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, I am one of those people who has had the opportunity to develop amazing relationships with law, law enforcement individuals, people who wear the uniform. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. it's a job. It's, you know, they want to do a good job and, and protect and serve, but they also recognize that they're humans in a uniform versus, you know, being classified because of a, a, a mutable trait, right? And yes, these law enforcement officers have have allowed me to re recognize that, yeah, there's some really good people in that uniform. So I, I preface my question because I want you to understand that I got mad love for a lot of uh, especially my IMPD folk, because I used to uh, be their IT person uh, here in Indianapolis and I developed great relationships. However. You know, one of the one of the reasons why there is such a, a, a huge distrust in communities um, is because of the treatment of some of our law enforcement and the assumption that they are always right. The last time I checked, the people in those uniforms are human and mm -hmm. humans are fallible. We want them on the streets. We want to be protected. We just don't want to be over policed. And when you're dealing with a law enforcement person, and, and this is going to come up, you're going to have to deal with it where you're not exactly sure the facts that are being provided by that agency um, are as accurate as they need to be. What are some of the steps or the methodology that you plan on using to make sure that the information and the facts and the evidence that you are getting is on the up and up? 
talk about talk about your communication chain with law enforcement and the relationships that you either have developed or must develop in order to have the fair treatment that you talk about. Well, the, one of the most common things, and it's one of the things that have been been in the news, is about search warrants. And police officers will be, come to court, will come in to the judge, and they're required to put all the information they have as a basis for the search warrant into an affidavit, a sworn statement, and present it to the judge and list specifically who's being searched, what property is being searched, what are we looking for? And here's all the reasons we think there's probable cause to believe that that evidence of a crime will be found on this person at this location. And a judge has to look only at the affidavit. The judge cannot go beyond the affidavit. The judge can't ask the officer questions. All the judge has to look, has to go on is what's in on that piece of paper. And the judge has to assume that it's since under oath, it, it's com this is substantially true, or at least to the best of their knowledge. But I've seen enough search warrant affidavits in the course of my work to know that the police know how to write them. <laughs> there is specific language they use that repeats in every single affidavit. And you have to look, again, you have to listen between the lines. You have to see what they're not saying. Hmm. You have to see how detailed they are. If they're relying on a confidential informant, You've got to take a look to see how it, are they telling you why they think this confidential rely, uh, informant is reliable. You have you have to make sure that they've done their job. But at that point, you have to if they if they've done everything that the law requires them to, you still have to decide is this the is it appropriate to enter a warrant and it doesn't have to and that's where when we get back to the probable cause standard it's not necessarily a slam dunk it's their best it, it's the best information they have at the time you have to you have to res, respect the law enforcement officer at the time but you also have to realize that you're authorizing the police to go into someone's home or business and essentially invade their privacy and look and look through their private belongings. There is an important balance here between the constitutional right to privacy in your own home and the legitimate needs of law enforcement in, in enforcing public safety. And that's something that is a daunting task and you hear about it when it goes wrong when things go bad but this is what judges do all the time and you have to be able to make the hard decisions either way but you have to remember that it's still it's going to affect somebody whether you grant that search warrant or not will someone committing a crime get away if you don't grant it or will a search warrant go terribly wrong, as we've seen recently? Mm. That's the hardest thing for a judge because you're dealing with people's lives here. And it, it's no small task, and it's definitely not for the faint of heart. But it's also not for someone who wants to just be tough on crime. Mm. That's powerful because I hadn't even thought about it from my train of thought was literally in the courtroom you went before we think <laughs> you're like wait before we even get to that point let's talk about the search warrant I, that's impressive because I, I would like to prevent court cases if we can help it right gully <laughs> absolutely 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 i think that's fascinating it's a fascinating take and and yes unfortunately your city has had to deal with the repercussions of those no-knock warrants. Now, has the Kentucky 
uh, General Assembly or governor done anything to look at those yet? I, I know that that's a policy thing, right? The the General Assembly has passed a limit, has not eliminated uh, no knock warrants, but they have very much limited when they can be granted. The city of Louisville, uh, Louisville Metro government has also passed a policy which says that 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 the police cannot seek no knock warrants except in in very limited circumstances as well. The problem is that we all talk about no knock warrants, but the Constitution require the U.S. Constitution and the Kentucky Constitution require the police to announce even when they're searching a warrant. That exception called the no knock warrant is just that there there have to be an there has to be an emergency situation which just which require. Uh, requires the police to go in immediately without announcing that's a hostage situation that's someone with a gun that's a, that's a, that's an immediate and present danger and unfortunately we've kind of let that slide we've said well you know drug dealing is inherently dangerous there's often guns around well that's yes that's sometimes true but not in every case mm -hmm. and you don't have you don't necessarily have to show up in the middle of the night and break down doors immediately. If you look, and I'll bring this up, it's not e even clear in the Breonna Taylor situation that the, that, that warrant was served as a no-knock, but it was granted as a no-knock, even though there weren't really any compelling cir circumstances to justify it. And that's something that again, we were reminded how you have to pay close attention to everything they're telling you. Because if a, as a judge, if you grant a warrant and you see they're asking for a no-knock question, you have to ask yourself serious questions about why is this absolutely necessary? And this is the reason why both the Louisville Metro and the Kentucky General Assembly have said we need to limit the circumstances beyond even what the constitution requires so that's valuable information because i know a lot of people um don't know that like i didn't know you know obviously i don't know kentucky, kentucky's constitution at all but i didn't realize that there was a con they they had to is that a part of, is that a part of the 14th that's actually the U in the u.s constitution it's called the knock and announce rule which and if you look at old old TV shows, the the police will say, "Open up in the name of the law," which is no one actually says that, but in some ways it's accurate, just because the police have to say, announce who they are, and if they have a warrant, they have to announce they're coming in with a warrant, because the idea is, if if people have to know, the people inside need to know that it's the police and not just a random intruder and that there are and that the police have a warrant and that there's an expectation of privacy in your own home that can that you have a right right to know under what authority the police are entering your house i love it i love it i'm gonna i'm gonna switch that's that's powerful right and i and i and, and I, I i like the way you answer because i know what, especially uh, people who are running for office they are reluctant to speak honestly about law enforcement because they, you know, come on. I mean, they, they, it, that is one of those issues where everyone is supposed to love a thing and sometimes we don't, <laughs> right? And you- Well, law enforcement, I'll be the first to say, it. law enforcement does a great job in, mo in a lot of things, but judges have, ro have their own role. Prosecutors have roles. Defense attorneys have roles. Law enforcement has a role. It's when we decide that one role is more important than another that things get out of whack. I love it. So I, I, you talked about your wife and how she battled a major medical hurdle. But one of the, and, and I'm I'm going to healthcare and I'm sticking here real quick. One of the things that uh, okay. is frustrating in Indiana is that. 
people who are struggling with mental health, um, there isn't a place for them to go. Um, and then you have the other uh, part of that, which is addiction, which here in Indiana, they have a lot of places where we can send you if you have addiction, but we don't have any place for you to go if you have mental health issues. But I also know that you, in Indiana, our jails and our county jails are, are the largest housers of people with addiction and with mental health issues. And then they end up in front of judges eventually, right? And so to, this next question is encompassing mental health, because in my opinion, addiction is a mental health crisis. You're using a substance mm -hmm. to sub self-medicate for whatever reason it is to, to, to deal with whatever's going on. And I believe that mental health is a struggle for millions of Americans, and I'm certain hundreds of, of thousands of Kentuckians and Hoosiers. When you are are on the bench and you have to evaluate a case and mental health is at play and at stake, what steps are you planning to take? Again, what methodology? I'm, I've been watching, I've been watching Supreme Court hearings. She has a methodology. I'm just saying. So I, I done picked up on some stuff. <laughs> yes. Let's go. <laughs> what methodology or steps will you take to address someone with mental health issues and then of course they need to be held accountable for whatever law they broke but how will you assess that and determine sentencing and, and i and i and i know this is hypothetical so I, I recognize how far you may or may not be able to go with that well to and a certain extent i have to be very careful because i can't actually promise as a judicial candidate i can't promise what i'm going to do on the bench right. but there Again, this is what we get back to, to what are the roles of the of judges, what are the roles of prosecutors and defense counsel. And the first thing is that it's very important for defense counsel in this case to bring any mental health issues to the attention of the judge. They have to say, I have reason to believe that my client may not be competent. And a judge in that situation can order a competency hearing or an evaluation to see, and there'll be mental health professionals who will evaluate a, a, a defendant to see if they're competent to stand trial or if they, or if they need treatment or in order to be competent to stand trial. So that's the, that's the first part of it. There are a lot of situations though, where you have people who may not, where they have may have mental health issues that don't necessarily affect their competency to stand trial but it may affect their judgment. I've had family members who've suffered from severe depression. Depression and anxiety can be debilitating, mm -hmm. but the question is, how do you account for it in court? Mm -hmm. Well, that again is the responsibility. We have an adversarial court legal system, which means that each side puts on their best evidence. And it's the responsibility of the defense counsel to bring it to the attention of a judge and to say, you need to, con you need to consider this in determining the appropriate sentence. You count defense counsel can, can and should say this person needs to be released before trial so they can get treatment. And the judge has to say, is that appropriate? And what guarantees am I going to have get from the defendant that they actually will get treatment and what progress is made here? So it's very important both for, for the attorneys to bring it to the attention of the judge, but it's also important for the, for the judge to recognize that there are a lot of different issue, things that can come into play, both in what the approach, whether the person's competent to stand trial, whether they can understand a plea agreement, mm -hmm. whether they may be influenced to, to accept a plea agreement because, because of a mental health issue. And then what is the appropriate, once there's a conviction, how much weight should a mental health or addiction issue be given in determining the proper sentence or conditions of release? Because you can, you can probate a sentence 
subject to conditions of mental health treatment. But there has to be resource, if there are no resources out there for treatment, then that's not going to do any good. I love it. And see, I worry about that because, you know, we don't, we're still, st we're still working through destigmatizing mental health. And, um, you know, I'm one of those folks who didn't understand it until I had to understand it. Right. <laughs> um, and, and we all go mm -hmm. through that maturation process. And I, I, I'm, I am pleased to understand that you recognize the systems that are in place and the tools that are in place to help folks. Um, and you can, you, you have the judici, what is it? You have the judgment to say, Hey, Let's, let's evaluate this situation. I'm not going to rule on this until we evaluate it. Y'all go off, do the medical thing, and then come back and holler at me so I can make a judgment from yes. this, right? Okay. Um, okay, so one of the things, um, this is going to be awkward, and I recognize it because I didn't even, I didn't realize this was even a thing until I, I read about it about 10 years ago. And we saw where um, uh, for-profit prisons were... Um, they were they were essentially okay they were bribing judges um to oh. um uh, they were it was a juvenile it was a ju in fact if i'm not mistaken the, the place is down in kentucky or tennessee one of the two is south of here right and there were judges who uh were on the essentially on the payroll if they um convicted a juvenile uh of a whatever crime and and sent them to this particular private institution um, then they got kickbacks, right? And I know mm -hmm. everyone starts out talking about, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm upstanding, and I'm not going to be. I'm, I want to, I want explain to the people what is it about your personality, what is it about your spirituality, because you mentioned that, that guides you from going to that dark side where money, because that's what it's all about. It's, it, you know, it had less mm -hmm. to do with the kids. And the facility as it did for that judge wanting to get up wanting to get broke off right what is it about your person and your spirit that would prevent you from going to that dark side give us a little bit of that well i'm familiar with uh at least one of the stories that you're referring to it actually happened in pennsylvania it's referred to as the kids for cash scandal and two judges in i think it's luzerne county pennsylvania were taking kickbacks from a private juvenile facility in order to to send ju uh, juveniles to uh, to these facilities, and they were essentially sending pretty much every juvenile that came through their court through the system without without it without even any legal representation. Hmm. That it's easy to say that it's about money but it's also about what you value that these are these are people who, these judges did not start off saying i'm gonna i'm gonna cash in on being a judge they were friends with powerful people who were very who who were very convincing and said we can we can run a juvenile facility for less for less than what the county can run and then you can help us get this off the ground sounds good and it'll be just as good sounds good oh but there may maybe they'll they'll be maybe there'll be something in it for you as a judge you have to remember who you work for that you work for the people this is not just you you are as a judge is beholden to the law and to uphold the highest principles of the law and that's something i've always kept in mind there are always going to be temptations there are always going to be temptations not just to enrich yourself but just to just to do what you want and not necessarily what the law requires but any judge on the bench is a servant of the people and the law we have focused in this country and we forget it that we are a government of laws not of men that too often we for we forgot 
forgotten that it is the law that that may that helps us keep our freedom because without it we are subject simply to the whims of powerful people but if we forget who exactly we are answering to the law and the people then it's easy to lose your way and there are always going to be those temptations there are temptations to simply go off and do what you, you know do what you th think is right without regard to the law but that's that's almost as bad because then you're making yourself the law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love it i love it man y'all know what we done blew through a whole hour Miguel, I said he could teach. Uh, Miguel, um, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't let you talk, but I had our questions. <laughs> you know, I think I think you know I've 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 met a few judges over the years, and you know, and and a great deal of attorneys, and very few have the understanding um, and teach like that. And I think that's something you know when we look at leadership in our communities going forward after definitely after the last two to three years and the things that we've all been facing across the country, you know, we've got to make sure that we are electing people who are here to teach, right? Here to educate. They're not here just to, to will the hammer of power, so to speak. Um, and that's what makes him a great candidate. And I think we'll make him a great judge, right? We'll, we'll be having, we'll have a leader in the community who, who once sees the community beyond its, its, its real geographic border, mm -hmm. um, which is super important. Um, and, and that he's, he's consistently educating himself on what's happening in our community at large, as well as at home. Um, yeah, we need real leaders, real judges. And I think that's also the difference when you think about, you know, when I think about all the candidates in this race, um, I, I think about the fact that he is the only one, um, who has a, a, gr a grand knowledge of the court system as a whole, mm -hmm. both it's, it's flaws. Uh, as well as what's good um, and and understands how the court can be effective and efficient um, and what fairness really looks like, right? And how we can create equity in those roles. And I think that's important. You know, you can get a trial lawyer who, and that's all they know. Um, and that's what they're probably gonna end up bringing to the table. Um, and you've got some people who are not great lawyers. They just have deep pockets and influential people behind them. Um, and then, now they want to be a judge. So I think we have to measure that. <clears throat> Tim is Tim is the real deal. You know, he's an educator. Um, he's been in he's been in the uh, in the court system working for the people for 33 plus years. Um, and he's published documents that, that that allow cases to to see, you know, where they should and shouldn't go. Man, this is a guy that people need to get to know and vote for. Oh, man. Well, I, I tell you what, um, I'm drawn in. You know, uh, this is my first time meeting him and I don't even live in a state. And now I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I get down there and have dinner with him, a cup of coffee or something? Cause I'm telling you, <laughs> you are very, you are very, Tim, you are very engaging. Um, you, one of the things that I loved about our conversation tonight was that you were not by any stretch of the imagination, arrogant, condescending or dismissive. Which unfortunately has a, a tend, you know, people who accomplish a lot academically have a tendency to not realize they're doing it, right? And, yeah. I, and I never even call it out when they do do it. I just, uh, oh, you want them, you know? <laughs> I don't. Need, but I want to give you that because I felt, and, and I felt something when I was talking to you. How about that? I felt okay. that you genuinely want to do the job to serve the community. And when a community like Louisville has had its struggles as it has had over the last several years and the, and the, and the country at large, to have that calming voice, that, that measured voice and someone who can, um, you start a lot of thoughts in my brain. So I know when you're on the bench and you're having to render your decisions, you're going to give that person some, on either side right? You're going to give them mm -hmm. something to think about. And that was my takeaway 
um, from our hour conversation tonight. And uh, I, I don't know, I can't vote for you, um, but if if Miguel Hampton says you the man, then I'm just going to go with it because then you the man. And I, I am really honored that I have the opportunity to chat with you tonight. Miguel, thank you for bringing this spirit into my space. This is, this is the kind of love, light, and joy that I'm always talking about. Now, I, don't, I know here in Marion County, judges can't fundraise. Do you, are you guys allowed to fundraise down there? In other counties they can, and in Marion County? Uh, no, uh, judges, are not, judges are not allowed to fundraise for a very good reason is that you don't want the appearance that the judge is asking for money in exchange for favorable ru okay. rulings. Well, we, we but I do have a website, timbuckleyforjudge.com, and I've got a Facebook page, Tim Buckley for Circuit Court Judge where you can find out more information. I'm also writing a blog on how Kentucky courts work, where recently I actually have talked about search warrants. And are you also holding any community events? I know that uh, the world is opening up a little bit. Uh, so I was wondering if you were gonna have any events that people could attend where they can come and talk to you? Uh, well, we have um, we have a an event coming up uh, and unfortunately, I don't have the exact date, but we uh, we have we're going to have a meet and greet in April. Uh, I'm going to be part of a candidates for several candidates forums. One next week. Uh, I've been just going around trying to meet people in the community. Well, I think you're doing an amazing job, and someone you know. And yeah, Dana, and Dana, I'll say this: there. So, if you go to Tim's website, right, it's it's Tim Buckley for Judge dot com. You'll you'll see an events page on there, um, and so we'll try to keep a lot of things posted there. And and I'll say this: where where judicial candidates cannot raise money, their friends and family can say it for them. Um, and this is a guy that we want to back and get behind, and they can go to the website and donate. Um, there is a treasurer to the campaign that they can reach out to as well. Um, so I, you know, I'll, I'll say it, you know, um, unapologetically, if you've got, you know, the dollars for a pizza and you don't want to go out to eat tonight, you know, with those some dollars at Tim, that'd be awesome if you're watching this stream and it, and it, and it doesn't matter where it comes from. Right. Cause you know, again, judges work for people and, you know, as many people come in and out of Kentucky, uh, for Derby and you're going to spend money on bourbon and, and horse racing, uh, you could, you could, you know spare that because campaigns cost money. Um, they do. They and, do. and no matter what office you're running for, there's a cost here. There's a cost for time. Um, most candidates cannot work a full job time job and run for office full time. Uh, and, you know, of course, yard signs that, you know, and, and all the other things that are there. So I'll throw that out there. If, if folks are find themselves in the great space um, and, and feeling willy uh, or willing not Willie. Willie might work too. Um, go to the campaign page and, and hit donate. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. All right. That is my show for tonight. This is a great hour. Tim Buckley, I, thank you so much for joining us on Turn Left. Miguel, man, I thank miss you, you so me. much. We got to do more shows. You know, it's campaign season here in Indiana. We got to get it. We got to get busy. I done already had two of your District 9 candidates on the show already. Let's go. I'm 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 good. Like I'm I'm coming back from Texas here in about a week, and um I'll be. I'll, let's go. I I'll, I'll even come to you, Indy. You we can do a listen, thing. So the way, the way technology works, <laughs> you can be in True Spain story. and we can do a show, baby. Because <laughs> you know I travel with gear, okay, so we can do want, that. I mean, I understand you in a Spanish speaking state, but we can just take you to Spain and do the show. I love it. All right, and of course, before we go tonight, um, to all my candidates uh, that are down ballot. I recognize you are not raising hundreds of thousands of dollars because you, you know, it's different type of race, right? But you still need that social media presence. You need that online presence. You need uh, some way to articulate who you are and why you're running for the office that you're running for it, to plaster it up on your, your website or whatever you want to do. You need to reach out to Indiana's own Dana Black, Dana at Indiana's own .com and Black Pro Studios so that we can come out and shoot your video, edit your video, and help you get your story out to the people. And we can we can target your message to your listeners. And that, I think that's very important. I want to help you. And I'm, I'm very affordable. That's why I say my down ballot. If you are a congressional guy, I'm going to need you to go down and see my man, Miguel, because he got a whole different setup. But if you want... <laughs> yeah, I'm... I'm 
You, I know my lane and I stay in it. All right. <laughs> Indiana's on Dana Black. Thank you so you much right for tuning now. in. I'll holler at y'all next time. Peace. Turn Left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.bensound.com.